for joining us. Oops, sorry. Thank you all. Yes, we're doing the call. Thank you all very much for joining us this evening for our talk with Vincent Valdez. I'm Bruno Natalin. I'm part of the membership team here, I'm sorry, the management team here at MGC, along with Robin Sharon, Kay San Antonio, and Anita Cardona, all of whom are here. And this is our fourth talk of the fall term. We have others programmed, so be sure to visit our website at manhattangraphiccenter.org to register for them. And while you're there, you'll be able to sign up for our mailing list and see our other events and course offerings. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to keep up to date. If you're not familiar with our organization, Manhattan Graphic Center is a community print shop that supports the learning and practice of fine art printmaking. We provide an affordable, inclusive, professional studio and exhibition space. Plus we offer classes and other public programs, including artist talks and scholarships. Manhattan Graphic Center would like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, the Sherman Foundation, the Pierre and Tana Matisse Foundation, our members and our other donors and friends, all of whom make our artist talks and other programming possible. Um, I want to say for tonight, if you have a question for Vincent, please type it into the chat that you see at the bottom of the screen. He would like to engage with your questions throughout the talk, so please let us hear from you. We'd like this to be like a conversation. Um, let me just tell you a bit about Vincent Valdez. Vincent Valdez is recognized for his monumental portrayal of the contemporary figure. His drawn and painted subjects remark on a universal struggle within various socio-political arenas and eras. He states, my aim is to incite public remembrance and to impede distorted realities that I witness, like the social amnesia that surrounds me. Valdez was born in 1977 in San Antonio, Texas. He received a full scholarship to study at the Rhode Island School of Design and earned his BFA in 2000 a recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation grant for painters and sculptors 2016, as well as residencies at the Skohegan School of Painting 2005, the Vermont Studio Center 2011, and the Kunstler House Britannia Berlin Residency 2014, Valdez currently lives and works in Houston. Exhibitions and collections include the Ford Foundation, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Mass MoCA, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, and the National Portrait Gallery, among others. He is represented by Matthew Brown, Los Angeles. So now I'd like to hand over things to Vincent Valdez. All right, Bruno, and uh, thanks to everyone for taking time out of your busy days uh, to join me, join all of us tonight. Um, I welcome you into the studio coming live from a very cold and wet Houston, Texas tonight. Um, and what I thought I'd do is, is just present you a little bit of insight into how I compose these images, how long I've been committed to the act of image making, um, as well as giving you a little bit of referential background into the kinds of mediums, formats, such as scale technique, um, my, my eagerness to bounce between uh, mediums like printmaking, lithography, etching, uh, serigraphs, large-scale oil painting, large-scale pastel drawing, ink drawings, and so forth. Um, but again, I, I really would love to encourage any one of you to, um, if you have any sort of uh, ideas or questions for me, feel free to um, uh, shoot them along because I, I'm much more interested in engaging in a conversation than I am hearing my own self speak for an hour. Um, so by all means, um, let me go ahead and share the screen. Okay, everybody can see this. So what I thought I'd, I'd do is, is uh, start by just talking a little bit about um, my own back, historic background. Um, the idea of making images for me is something that started extremely early. I would even venture to say a little bit too prematurely. You know, I think maybe because I was the middle child, I knew that my form of communication was going to be uh, in, in a 
was going to need a different approach in order to, to be seen and heard. And so I began drawing according to my parents before I was walking or talking. Um, I knew immediately that this was something that was uh, came so naturally for me. It was so easy for me in a way that I just assumed everybody could draw. Uh, and it wasn't, or it was as early as the kindergarten classroom that I began to realize very quickly to the left of me, there was stick figures, to the right of me was scribbles. And I was actually thinking about things like form, uh, depth, perspective, and storytelling, right? And so by the time that I am nine, 10 years old, I pick up my first paintbrush. It was at an after school project, uh, after school mural project at a place called the, the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. And the theme was uh, peace and justice. And so I had never painted before, but like I said, I, I was drawing pretty extensively, very obsessively, right? I, I never knew my great grandfather, but every time that we'd go to my grandparents' house in the south side of San Antonio, it really was like my first museum experience because in these little rooms and hallways of their house were these canvases dated 1890, 1939. And although I, I only knew uh, the painter, my great grandfather, the painter through these images, I was so, fascinated and obsessively compulsive trying to compulsively trying to deconstruct understand figure out how what it took what it meant to be an image maker so by the time i'm nine ten years old i saw i began painting murals for the very first time and my doors of perception were blown wide open it was here that was my first true real educational experience in life because not only did I figure out that um, I had the opportunity to be able to tell stories through images, I saw that it went a step further for me, right? I had the potential, these images had the potential to embody other people, to be of service to, uh, to an entire community. I began working throughout the, mostly the housing projects in San Antonio, Texas. And sitting up on these scaffolds, two, three stories high, with my mentor at that time, 19-year-old painter Alex Rubio, tremendously powerful artist, who took me under his wing, and we became like Batman and Robin, right? We spent every day, every weekend, every summer, bouncing from community to community, telling these stories about marginalized people, marginalized communities. And we saw how these communities began to, uh, protect and treat these uh, images as their own personal shrines, right? Representations, representational symbols of pride. And I, that was it for me. I knew that I would forever commit my life to being an image maker, but it was my, going to be my quest to find various ways and mean, the means to tell stories about people and for people. And so as we bounce, buzz through a few of these images, um, you know, I want you to keep in mind the idea of storytelling and the way that, I, that one can approach um, the act of being a storyteller. It I, you know, my, my mission and my artistic intention in the studio over a lifetime now has always been uh, about finding various ways to challenge myself as an image maker, right? Whether it be through drawing, through painting, through sculpture. Um, these images, regardless of their scale, regardless of the mediums, regardless of the technique, have to function on three various levels. For me, they always, A, must always be, uh, have a personal context injected into it. That's at the core, the nucleus of, of these images, right? It's my own personal experiences and observations about my own lifetime and, and my own observation of this time in the world, right? Number two, they have to seduce the viewer. They have, the goal for any artist, for any image maker, right, is, is to keep the viewer 
this attention for more than 3.5 seconds, right? And in an, in an age, in a, a day and age like, like this, where there's very short attention spans, uh, that, that's, uh, that in itself is a big challenge. Number three, the, the viewer must find ways to connect and see themselves within the image, right? You don't have to be Mexican American and have the Mexican American experience from the Mexican American community like I did growing up in, San, in a community like San Antonio, right? You don't have to um, regard you, the important, what's most important is that the viewer finds an own, uh, their own personal human connection and element to these images. And so by the time I get to a school like the Rhode Island School of Design, right, I come equipped with already 10 to 12 years of just trying to refine my skills, finding ways to compose pictures so dramatically and so powerfully that it acted again as a form of seduction to keep you there, to hold your attention. But by the time I'm at RISD, I'm really starting to hit some brick walls for the first time, but what am I going to do with this? Technique isn't enough, right? When I saw that many of my peers uh, in undergrad uh, at RISD were just trying to understand their craft and, and hone in on it and master it, I was really, I spent my time at RISD trying to ask myself, but what am I going to say with this, right? What, what, what do I say with images and, and who, um, how do I separate myself from amongst, you know, a hundred other painters? And so then I come across um, a subject like you see here, a historic subject uh, based in Los Angeles, 1943, called the Zoot Suit Riots. Right? I stumble across this topic and I begin to immediately question, but why don't I know about this? Why have I never been told about this? Why have I not been, uh, uh, taught or, or read about this before. And this is where something really ignites in me. Well, then it's my responsibility as an artist, right? As both artist and citizen to share this, to tell this story. I, I will bring it back into the American memory, right? Uh, a, a canon of, of American history. And so I tried to, I sat in my little cubicle studio at RISD and I tried to ask myself, well, because there's not really a lot of resource material that existed in 1999 when I created this painting at age 21, 22, what would it have looked like had I been there, had I been witness to an, an event like this? More than anything else, I was never interested in becoming a history painter. For me, the exciting, interesting aspect about being a, an artist living and working in the 21st century was trying to find methods and means to connect the past to the present. Because I think it's, um, I always think about um, the words of American social critic, Gore Vidal, who once stated, we are the United States of amnesia. We learn nothing because we remember nothing. And, after this painting, you know, in my final semester at, uh, at RISD, I'm now back in San Antonio, Texas, staring at, um, you know, a few blank walls and blank canvases before me, but what am I going to do next, right? How do I top that last image? Because that image for me, uh, the Zoot Suit Riot painting, in many ways, uh, uh, blew doors wide open and things began ha happening uh, very rapidly for me as far as getting this work out into the world. And so now things get very exciting for me. I feel like I have so many stories to tell. I start looking around in my own community, right? Not only in San Antonio, but what I mean by that is my own American community at that time. It's now 2000, the turn of the century, 21st century's brand new, a new dawn, a new rising generation. And so I come up with one of these very first images that was that I completed shortly after graduation titled Yo Soy Blacksican, which translates to mean I am Blacksican. And to give you a little bit of further insight into how I began constructing these stories, you know, my, my younger brother Daniel was in high school at the time and I asked him, you know, I've, I've never asked you this before, but when you're filling out your SAT forms, how do you identify yourself? And he says, well, what do you mean? I said, well, are you Hispanic? He said, nope. 
Are you Chicano? I don't know what that means. Are you Mexican? Man, I don't even speak Spanish. Are you Latino? No. And at that time, Tupac Shakur had just been, had just passed away and he kissed two of his fingers, put him up to the sky and said, I'm black again. I thought, wow, that's it. This is absolutely brilliant, right? This is the idea, the new idea, the new school has arrived. So I ran to, this, uh, to the studio and I got this giant sheet, eight foot sheet of paper. This is the first time I pick up pastels as a tool. I wanted to see what I could do with a brand new, I wanted to challenge myself to try something entirely brand new. And so I created this uh, uh, powerful, defiant character, sort of waltzing right in, you know, just sort of streaming on by, on by like a low rider, low and slow and quietly in his neighborhood at night, right? He's got the backwards baseball cap. He's got the, the hip hop gear. Here's an individual sporting the, almost an ancient Mayan profile, but identifies more with black culture, hip hop culture than he does, then he identifies with his own culture. This is the new American story, right? But at the same time, it's, it's what in many ways, it's a nod to what America has always been, this giant pot of chili, right? Mixed together and spit back out. Nowhere in America would, you, would it be an American landscape without the golden arches and McDonald's in the background, the coin, uh, modern day America. And then things just start really start to, to begin to naturally play themselves out in the studio. I somehow went through RISD for three and a half years without ever stepping foot inside the printmaking department. How I got away with that, I'll never understand. And so I met a printmaker, a master printmaker in Texas who said, hey, how have you never tried lithography? If you enjoy drawing, you'll enjoy lithography. And so this was my very first attempt at a small lithograph. And I immediately, instantly fell in love. And lithography has been one of um, my most um, revisited forms of printmaking today. And so, you know, the, the, these stories, these tales that I begin spinning in the studio in my own imagination, right? I'm, I'm drawing not from life, but from imagination. Uh, I'm, I'm staging some of these scenes in the studio. Um, at that time, I had a Polaroid camera, right? And then I'd run the studio and reinvent. And I start to, to realize that um, there is a way of, there, that I become very interested in blurring the line, again, not only between what is past and what is present, but what, between what is real and what is myth, right? It becomes my own sort of social commentary about reality in 21st century America. So my first talk, attempt at, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I thought it would be a good, uh, just a, you said you wanted some questions, so. Uh, sure. Just, um, but please finish your thought, I'm sorry. Uh, so here is my first attempt at uh, silk screening, right? I, I go to uh, Los Angeles, East LA, uh, legacy printmaker, print, printing press, uh, self-help graphics. And I come up with an image that in many ways becomes my own call and response. You know, at that time, the individual by the name of Mumia Abu-Jamal had been uh, executed by the NYPD, shot 41 times, right? In the United States of America, when um, this story unfolded, it re revealed that, and again, keep in mind, this is 2001, 2000, when this uh, incident occurs. Here we are 22 years later, um, facing these sort of same kind of tales in this country. Um, when asked why they, needed to shoot him 41 times. NYPD exclaimed that he was reaching for his weapon. Uh, it was later revealed that he's reaching for his ID. Um, go ahead and ask the, what, what's your question, Drew? Um, well, this question is from, I have a, some questions, but also um, Anne asks, the paintings and prints seem to be collaborative with the subjects. How do you find the people? Uh, I guess so, the person. So again, um, the, uh, the figures, for me, the, the goal is to, to skew your own imagination as the viewer, right? I want to confuse you so that you cannot figure out quite, again, what is real, what is fictionalized. Um, and so in a work like this, a large scale drawing, you know, 
eight or 10 feet on paper with a lithograph crayon. Um, you know, I actually asked my landlord to pose as the main figure in the foreground to imitate, to, to echo that famous pose, the all-American pose of Uncle Sam's finger, I want you, versus the background, the horse that he's sitting on, the entire background, which is entirely invented, right? But, but at the same time, this scene that you're witness to unfolding on this two-dimensional surface, is a historic scene now, right? So this was, it was contemporary history at that time. It was the MacArthur Park May Day Rally when I was living in Los Angeles on May the 1st, 2004, I believe. I was at this event, I ran home after witnessing what unfolded that day and spent about two or three months uh, creating an image like this. So for me, it's really extremely important as an artist, right? Um, that all of these um, variations about what is uh, what it means to be living, working, and experience uh, experiencing modern day the modern day really um, begin to converge, um, tangle around themselves, and then get regurgitated back out through uh, or as an image. Can I ask you about? Um... Just to go back when you were talking about your childhood and how you started so early, I was just wondering what were your influences at that time and if those influences persisted in your later development as an artist. So this is a perfect moment to, to address this. So my uh, earliest influences, you know, I didn't have access. I didn't know about Caravaggio and Velasquez and uh, classical realism. And, and so where I, you know, really attribute a lot of my um, knowledge about composition, framing, cinematic lighting, cinematic design, um, and human emotion, right? Even the way that I, I learned all of these elements, including the human figure, was from the television screen. I would ask my mother at that time to run and, and press pause button on the VCR. I would run to my room, get a small sheet of tracing paper. I would place it over the screen and then I would trace, you know, Christopher Reeve is Superman, Sylvester Stallone is Rocky. And, and so the capacity to understanding the dramatization of human emotion, right? I learned from cinema. And it's such, it's still so evident in my work today, you know, the, the idea of not only conveying of, of trying to capture you as a viewer, as an audience, but the way that these cinematic sequences begin to unfold as a complete narrative, right? Um, and so many, in many ways in the studio, I felt like a movie, more of a movie director than I did as a painter. And so here's like a friend of mine who is a journalist who I just thought would be a perfect fit for this face that I saw a glimpse of in my own imagination. But you know, it was up to me to invent the light, invent uh, you know the backgrounds, the skin textures, the details. The idea of telling a bigger story. I mean, I think that around this time, you know, again, in another example of um, this is my second lithograph. I start to envision um, these ongoing series as an unfolding novel, really. Chat, various chapters that begin to construct themselves and begin to connect themselves to each other as one ongoing story, right? That is being unfolded. I start to see these things moving, breathing, um, storytelling as, um, as graphic novels, really. Um, and then I began to use for the first time printmaking as a medium to do what I feel like the drawings and paintings can't quite do. I start to think about how to present and package these things as, um, again, as, as books almost, right? Uh, and so here was a series that I created first as a, a series of 17 large scale charcoal drawings. But when I finished the entire series of, of drawings, I felt like there was still something lacking. And so I went back 
to the drawing board and I, I began collaborating with a, a press that I've worked with for over 20 years now, Heron Hound Press in San Antonio, Texas. And I thought, here's where I can kind of tell the story and really truly echo what the story is based on, which was the Stations of the Cross tablets that I you know, uh, observed very, very frequently as a kid stuck in mass and in CCD classes on Saturday. You know, I, I remember being so entranced by these cinematic tales about Christ bearing the cross and going through each station. So I, I took the story, that sort of, that story as symbol, as metaphor, um, and reinterpreted it as, uh, or within the, the arena of boxing. Here, I wasn't too interested anymore in the idea of solely a religious intention or an, an, a solely a, a, an interest in the sport of boxing, but I'm more interested in the idea of, a, of these sorts of examples of rites of passage for young men throughout world history. These, these martyrs, if you will, um, these sort of prescribed notions of masculinity that I embossed each each uh, image as tablets with the Roman numerals. They also be, they they also begin to echo boxing trading cards, which I really loved. And so again, this, there's this blurring, right? This sort of um, union, this marriage between various facets historically of the way that um, uh, stories have been presented. My first etching, uh, and so at this at this point, you know, I'm really just having a lot of fun in the studio, and and but it's always been my goal to be somewhat of a, a shape shifter in the studio. Just try to push myself constantly. You know, I'm so terrified even today of becoming stagnant in the studio, of becoming predictable, and so. I will make it a point to find various ways to just bounce between, again, mediums, formats of image making, um, scale, palettes, black and white versus color, um, series versus single standing images, sculpture, video pieces. The idea is always the same, right? The ideas are always floating around and the ideas are solidified, but it's finding various ways of, of um, animating these images. You know, again, uh, I think that, you know, it, it, part of that process of challenging my, my own self as an artist is um, um, finding ways to um, breaking out of my own comfort zones, right? And so many, many instances have required or um, have challenged me to um, create work entirely without the human figure because it's, you know, I'm so widely known for the figure and it's so, the figure for me is, you know, is always uh, centralized, right, behind the ideas. But over the years, um, you know, it's been a really exciting thing for me to try to find ways, various ways of, of presenting these stories um, that go beyond just being centered around the human portrait. And so then we get to, um, I'm gonna keep track of time here. So we get to, uh, you know, some of the more recent works, you know, over the past decade, um, you know, these really powerful, his powerfully historic subjects, right? Something like um, the lynching of Mexicans and Mexican Americans in the American Southwest, right? A, a subject that is entirely, almost entirely forgotten, if not ignored, within the canon of American history. And so one of the things that I did in 2013 and 14 was set out on this series titled The Strangest Fruit, where I took, I borrowed and adapted the title of the poem written by Abel, Abel Maripool, Strange Fruit, which was made famous in 1949 as a song by uh, singer Billie Holiday. But here, I created a diptych as two silk screens. The introduction to this series um, presents you with the verses from that poem upside down and um, 
uh, right side up in both English and Spanish. And we adapted now as a corrido, which is a famous traditional song of um, or a format of song making, songwriting in, in Mexican American and Mexican culture. It took me an entire year to complete this series. Now this is really where the start of the work begins to take another dramatic twist and shift, right? Even just in scale. Now these things are really beginning to unfold as, as dramatic graphic novels, right? Where the body, now I'm thinking about full, presenting a full animated motion uh, and sequence that unfolds as you, the viewer, uh, walk down um, each one of the, or, or walk down the body of work. And then I began working primarily in series over the past few years with a project like this title, The Beginning is Near, an American Trilogy. I began this work in 2015. You know, at that moment in time, I was reflecting on where we were at as a collective society in the United States of America on the heels of the Obama administration. And, and it was very evident to me that America was so eager to pat itself on the back and say, job well done, been there, done that. We are now a post-racial society. So I took the idea of, of white supremacy and tried to re-envision what that looked like and what that meant, how that was translated in 21st century America. Here it is presented in black and white, easy to fool you to thinking that this is a scene from 1939, 1920, right? And then you start to look closely and find modern day images like this. And so I used the hoods and the somewhat archaic symbols of the burning cross now found and refashioned, repackaged and resold throughout various forms of advertising, economics, right? Political uh, policies. And the concentration is the title, the city. Let's think about for far too long, uh, we as a nation fool ourselves into thinking, well, that's those people in those places. And here I am an entire year, 365 days of working on this one painting that ended up being 37 feet of canvas. And never before had I experienced uh, a moment in the studio where what, something that I was uh, painting actually began unfolding in real life. Charlottesville unfolds, um, you know, the, uh, the elections are at that time are under full swing. And this thing just began taking a life of its own um, as an image, even before it had left the studio. Normally it's not until they leave the studio that these works, you know, in many ways become their own living entities out in the world. You get a sense of scale here. And then that quickly morphs into, again, an unfolding trilogy, right? At the very, in the very last two months of creating an, in the city, um, I, was, I was painting in the studio one day and it was while I was watching um, the funeral procession of Muhammad Ali. And it really struck me. And I remember thinking at that time, I was so eager to cross that finish line with the city. that I remember it was so crushing to me to think like, damn it. I just envisioned the next chapter and now it's going to turn into a whole other series for another year. And here, what I did was I selected uh, 11 of the eulogists who presented at Ali's funeral. Funeral. Here was the moment in time that it was this really interesting um, presentation of how America uh, in itself was in conflict with its own self the old versus the new. Here we were um, as a society celebrating, honoring, paying tribute to a Muslim American, a black American, an American who stood up to and defied the American government in his lifetime and won. Knowing what was looming over the, the horizon, um, 
I'm not sure what happened here. And then a, a series like Dream Baby Dream, I knew that uh, after you know two, three years into this two-part trilogy, or into the first two parts of the trilogy, I knew that I just couldn't leave it quite there for the viewer yet, that I had to find a sense of optimism, a way to move beyond, to, to offer some sort of glimpse into how um, the future of um, the United States may look. And so now back in full blown color, I presented the first few, the first four of the series titled, uh, The Beginning is Near, an American Trilogy, Chapter Three, The New Americans. What I am actively working today to search for, locate, and honor 21 Americans in the 21st century who are fighting the good fight for their fellow citizen and non-citizen. Not for fame, not for power, not for profit, because it's, but because it's simply still the right thing to do. And so here are three individuals whose stories have very much inspired me, motivated me, encouraged me, helped me to see the light in the studio, to get up every day and to keep on pushing forward. And so these monumental portraits that stand at almost nine or 10 feet on canvas become like these defiant, resistant pillars amidst the crumbling society. I like to refer to the new Americans, to these new Americans as stubborn pulses in a dying heart. And so you, this gives you an idea of what the studies, the drawn pencil studies look like. You know, one of the things that I do, one of the games that I play in the studio is that I set these timers for an hour. And as that clock is ticking down, I'm drawing as fast as I can. It's a good way to keep my chops moving, to keep me from getting rusty. And most importantly, it's a great way to try to force me to increase my speed in the studio. Um, and so I normally warm up this way in the studio, get the hands and the eyes moving, the brain working, and then I bounce the big canvases. But this gives you a glimpse into what some of these studies look like first. And in so many ways, right, drawing for me surpasses to this day, surpasses painting in many ways. Drawing for me is the key to painting. It, it is the, there's a certain immediacy and honesty, a power behind drawing that I've still yet to really find and establish in painting. And then I'll end off with the last few Im images here from the most recent bodies of work. You know, I think that for me, uh, at this moment in the studio, I'm having so much fun breaking away now on the heels of the American Trilogy series, even though the New Americans chapter is still ongoing, it's going to take me 40 years to complete it probably, but I figure I have the entire century left before my deadline is up. Um, but what I'm most excited about in the studio is because I was so locked in since 2015 to these specific, very specific projects and themes. Uh, now it's just sort of busted wide open and I'm feel, I feel free again in regards to the ways that I'm just kind of scattered in terms of ideas. Now I'm just trying to take any ideas that I have and, and find ways to force them to work together, right? But more, more importantly, I'm trying to make sense out of the ways that they don't work together in the studio. And so to take, to look at an image like this, you know, one of the challenges I set up for myself um, while I was working on this painting last year was that I said, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm gonna work entirely from memory now, right? This scene, none of it ever existed as opposed to something like, this scene that, you know, this is an individual that I know, that I know personally, right? This is um, referencing, you know, I went and did studies of the ocean in, on the West Coast. I went and like looked at old Homer paintings and um, Jericho paintings here. You know, I was even looking at um, Universal Studios Globe, right? And so, but I was mostly thinking about um, these sort of hidden um, 
memories that um, are based after an actual experience, like when I was 10 years old and watched the movie Scarface and that final scene when he's sitting before the mountain of cocaine, before his own demise and collapse as a character. There's this one small golden uh, statue pushed on the side of his desk of this nude golden figure holding this, the globe with the text around it, the world is yours, right? But then I get to an image like this where now it's entirely 100% invented. You know, after a lifetime of honing in on my crafts, of really looking clear, you know, examining everything that I possibly can carefully and practicing, endlessly practicing. I feel for the first time in my life, the work is now exactly where it should be, where I need it to be so that I can make it do whatever I want to do and make it say what I need it to say. And then I'll end off here with um, a work that is now in progress. Um, it's a box a suite of lithographs titled Since 1977. These are the covers of the boxes. Now with this black silk ribbon that emblazons in Old English since 1977. And what I've done is I've taken every president since the year of my birth and lined them up, deconstructed them entirely to a pair of eyes, foreheads, and in some cases, hair pieces. But for the viewer that has the ability to line them all up, uh, side by side, there's a very subtle occurrence. There's a gradual sinking and a decline of these heads. Here is a decline of legacy, a decline of history, a decline of um, knowledge, a decline of progress, right? It is the American empire um, as a giant right, um, facing this sort of eternal abyss. The, uh, the, the last image missing here is, um, you know, the, the viewer faces one blank void. And I, when I created um, these lithos originally as a suite of drawings in 2019, you know, it was that, again, that, that challenge to you, the viewer, to find ways to become active, engaging, and willing participants in the telling, in the foretelling of your own fates and our own destinies, right? We supposedly get to decide uh, what comes next. It was very eerie after, uh, you know, January 6th to think for a moment that these drawings were somewhat prophetic in the sense that that void might not have been filled. And then the last final few images here, this is a very recent etching here that um, honors um, Tex-Mex accordionist from San Antonio, Texas, you know, uh, um, a giant in the way that he forever reframed and reshaped American music in more ways than most people acknowledge. Um, you know, he is now in his early 80s. And so one of the things that I did was after creating the etching, I went and I found Flaco Jimenez and had him autograph each one of the etchings and then presented him with one as a gift. But for me, this becomes so much, I mean, printmaking, the interest has always been about utilizing printmaking as a means to reach the masses, right? So when we think about the, the historic uh, context of printmaking, you know, I, I've always used printmaking as this way of uh, making it more um, accessible to people. You know, I realized very early on, 20 years ago, after beginning to get involved with galleries and institutions, that very, very few people will have access to uh, not only the ownership, but also as viewer of large scale drawings and paintings. And so never have I allowed a gallery to entirely control um, the stock of my prints. I, to this day, the only way that I, I fund my own prints 
and I sell my own prints through Instagram. I mean, I keep it very simple and I try to keep them as affordable as possible um, so that it gives everyone a chance. You know, it's, it's my um, belief that um, the, the true nature and power of art is when it has accessibility to people. And, and for me, that means people even beyond the arena of the art world. And then the last slide here, um, you know, this is the most, most recent body of work that I just completed a few months ago in Jersey City over with, as a collaborative piece with Gary Lichtenstein, um, tremendous master printmaker. And so what Gary and I did was we took a series of small etchings that I created a few years back. Um, and I told him that I wanted to have some fun, you know, I wanted to do something that was just totally different. Uh, and when I walked into his studio, um, he had this strange, almost like installation material, um, packaging material. I've never seen anything like it. It's like a cross between fabric and paper or plastic. Um, it's very odd. And before he even asked me, we made eye contact and we both instantly knew, you know, I, I remember shouting out, let's do it. And so we ran uh, to, the, to the actual um, press and, and, we and we saw immediately how this material began to absorb and hold the ink on silk screens and wow, it created such a beautiful ghostly effect, you know, really haunting quality that, that helped further uh, and embody the message of this series of drawings titled Siete Dias, which is translates to mean seven days, where I created um, this uh, large series of portraits of missing persons from El Salvador in the 1980s due to uh, American intervention in Latin American policies. And so we'll go ahead and, and end it here. Um, Again, if there's any, if anybody has any questions, um, comments, feel free to. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there are some. Um, Aneda commented, just a comment from Aneda, uh, speaking about the New Americans. I think, um, just saying, love these. Um, so, and also Kay asked, I believe, about the lithographs of the presidents. She says, uh, or, I'm sorry, they say this is also incredible. How big are the lithographs? Okay, great. So, uh, what was it for? Tell me the first question again. Uh, the, well, the first was a comment saying oh, love okay. these in reference to the new Americans from Aneda. Awesome, thank you, Aneda. And then, and then Kay, uh, was, Kay was asking, I believe, about the lithographs of the presidents, if that's correct. Kay. So the the, uh, the suite since 1977 is uh, is I'm very happy to say very uh, it's small scale for me. So I think each, each drawing is 24 inches by 30 inches. Um, I think I use, uh, our, our, I normally with lithography or drawing with that little pencil, I almost always stick with a, um, uh, a Korn's pencil number, number two. And I never really venture beyond that. You know, for me, it gives me just the right precise amount of control, contrasting and value. But I just got no, there's no other drawing material, um, even oil pastel that has, that captures that abysmal void of black. It's such a beautiful, rich oil-like texture with the grainy, starry quality um, that lithograph crayons have. And so I'm so in love with it as a medium. Um, I really enjoy still to this day working on mylar and paper and presenting Draw, project, presenting these images with a litho crayon uh, just as solely as drawings. I do it even more so because I don't know of many other artists or draftsmen that present drawings in that fashion. And so I always love going against the grain, right? And, um, and again, almost like when I was a student, really trying to ask myself and find ways to stick out like a sore thumb. Um, and Kay uh, responds, saying that is still large for printmaking. Um, Robin, <laughs> Robin is asking, could you talk about the metaphor of boxing? Absolutely. So boxing for me over the past 22 years now has by far been one of the most revisited subjects for me. Um, 
As a matter of fact, I was just in San Francisco a few weeks ago with the amazing American writer, Joyce Carol Oates, who some of you may uh, have seen on Netflix recently with her, you know, she wrote the novel for the movie Blonde about Marilyn Monroe, amazing writer, but most people don't realize that she has a very uh, small book in 1987 titled On Boxing. And so Joyce and I spent, you know, over an hour and a half just going back and forth about our love for boxing. For me, um, it's such a, uh, an, a fascinating part of American history. You know, boxing was, was twice banned in this country. It was for many, many uh, generations coined as the poor man's sport. And so even though I love it as, as, a, um, as an actual um, sport itself, like I'm mo much more interested in the idea of what it represents as a symbol. For me, it becomes representation of the struggle of the classes in America, it, that struggle of not only trying to convince yourself, um, even when odds are all odds are stacked against you, that it is going to be necessary to stand to get back up and fight. Uh, but most importantly for me, it becomes, it embodies that tragic uh, and undying tale about what survival means in America for. Uh, mostly marginalized uh, communities in this country, right? Boxing is for a long time, gener for generations, has always been a golden ticket, the one golden ticket out. Um, and, uh, and I think that the part, the detail, the icon that really um, I try to inject in all of these fictional characters um, that portray themselves as boxers in my work, is that moment of when they realize that the fight is fixed. It was fixed all along, right? Uh, the matches, the game is rigged. But even knowing that, they know that the fight must continue and the fighter must carry on. Robin, I uh, believe, says uh, she read the, her book on boxing. So. I, I had a question, um, you know, when you talked about how you started by literally copying off a TV screen, um, you know, I immediately thought of graphic novels and you, you speak about graphic novels. Have you done any like graphic novels in the more traditional sense where it's, you know, do you know what I mean? Or do you have, do you have any interest in doing any work like that? Or um, I have had a very long, long interest. Um, as a matter of fact, let me grab this thing real quick. I'll give you guys a personal peek. Um, I am currently in the process of finally, after all these years of working in this kind of visual format, um, I'm partnering with a very good dear friend of mine who's an amazing writer from uh, down in Laredo, Texas, so right near down the border. And, uh, we are working to um, tell, present to the viewer a tale about modern day America um, in five short fictional stories that he's writing. Um, and so the idea is to minimalize the format of a graphic novel. And each tale will consist of one to two lines maximum of text and three to four and three images right and so I'm having so much fun just inventing these scenes of trying to literally you know uh, construct a story now and and considering text um, one of the other projects that I'm just about to begin um, this coming February is working with Arion Press who is out in San Francisco amazing press you know I've done work with uh, William Kentridge, Carol Walker, um, and so forth. But I'm going to come in and illustrate um, Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five. And so I'm extremely excited about this. And I've, give, I've been given free reign over um, interpretation, right? In any way that I fit. So they approach, it's a very, they run a very small edition and they approach these things as art pieces, right? And so um, it would be something different for me, something, a different way of working. 
but I also feel at the same time, in, in many ways, it's the way that uh, I'm already thinking and seeing in the studio. Yeah, yeah that, that looks amazing. That's really great. Um, Anne is asking, what is the idea for the painting behind it? Uh, so this, this painting I began several months ago when uh, these guys behind me made their big decision, uh, announced a big decision, and I started the work about two hours after. You know, I think in many ways, um, it's like that MacArthur Park painting. Where I, I, I really do try to approach this work as not only documentation, but it really is my way of testifying. I present it as a report. It is testimony about uh, what I see and live in 21st century America. And so I'm slowly chipping away at this piece in between other projects, but the title is going to be called Supreme, right? And so like the city painting and like other works that I sh shared with you, it's my way of trying to encourage you, the viewer, to, to go beyond what you think you already see and might already know. Right? The real story, the real tale being told here isn't the individuals sitting behind me. Right? They only become the veil of what they are, what has long been disguised, right? Or denied at least in this country. And so, like this blood red curtain that is being uh, lowered on us on a grand stage are, uh, and again, as veil, it begins to reveal these hidden sort of icons behind like a glimpse of the Manifest Destiny painting, um, a portrait of the real owners of this country, like Norman Rockefeller, uh, I'm sorry, Nelson Rockefeller. Uh, and then, you know, a, a, a nod to uh, the canon of American art history, like this landscape, American landscape by Albert Beardstead, right? And so here becomes this codex, this hierarchy that, reveals its entire self about what America um, it provides you a glimpse of what America today is um, in, in many ways uh, built off in the past, right? Um, it becomes this visual codex, but it's up to you, the viewer, to try to solve this puzzle. Um, you know, the facial expressions, the, the decapitated Lady Justice um, with her head, you know, it's, it's over the top, absolutely. And, and in my way, it becomes, it inserts itself into the legacy of political cartoonists in this country, right? right? Which for me have always played a big role, just like comic book artists have. Um, there is a sort of underlying sense of sick, twisted humor, but in many ways, it's the one thing uh, that I think um, provides us an accessible, easier approach to trying to make sense of the madness that, um, and the distortion and chaos that lies out there in the world beyond the studio doors. Sorry, Aneda has a reaction to that saying it's very honest. So it's very honest. Uh, honest. Good, I'll take it. <laughs> I actually had just a, a quick question. What is your, your work? Your, your work is amazing and you're so prolific. What is your studio day like? I imagine you must be working like 20 hours a day <laughs> in my in my estimate. You know, I was a lot more crazier in, in my younger days. I, I was describing a little bit earlier to Bruno and the team that um, after, because I started so early on in life, this is all I've ever done. It's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, I'm slowing down a little bit. You know, my legs are slowing down. The eyes are getting a little bit blurry. Um, the hands are falling asleep a little faster. And I think in many ways, like my attention span isn't quite what it used to be. You know, I used to only work on one project at a time and I wouldn't move until I cross that finish line. Nowadays, like in the studio, if you could see around here, I have literally 25 giant paintings and I just come in every day and go from station to station. But a typical day for me is getting in here uh, by noon 
I, I normally use the first hour or so um, to just try to get situated, um, you know, tackle annoying emails and business stuff. Uh, and then I, I work like from one to usually 5.30 without, trying, without um, stopping. I'll break for dinner for an hour, hour and a half. And then I'm, and then I'm really, it's the evenings, that moment between 7.30 to 11.30 that I really feel like that's when it gets fun. I really get to work. You know, I've always been more of a, a night owl that way. But when I was younger, I mean, I was psychotic. I, I would come in and from the studio and I would go from 1 to 1.30 every day, seven days a week. Now I'm trying to really force myself to take the weekends off just to recover, uh, and it and it helps. Um, you know, the I think many people don't realize or don't um, take into account the amount of physical labor that goes into um, working in the studio. Right, you're on your feet. Um, you know, the hands are part of your body. They get exhausted, right? The eyes and and the mind and the uh, and so. It really is um, a matter of just trying to keep this machine going. Um, I think what frustrates me most at, at this particular moment is that I feel so on fire in terms of concepts, but I don't, I get so, um, I get very frustrated at trying to figure out how not to get overwhelmed because my brain is not working faster than my body. In my younger years, it was it was it was reversed, you know. But you know, it's it's just another curveball. It's another challenge, and uh, and I welcome it. And it's going to be a matter of just trying to figure out how to shift gears a little bit uh, for the next chapter. That might mean um, downscaling some of the work. Um, but again, I've been saying that I've been saying the same thing for ten years, and it keeps getting larger and larger. And so. One of the ideas that I'm very excited about is a new series titled, um, It Was a Very Good Year, 1987. And I'm trying to recreate from memory entirely images, going back to the beginning, I'm trying to recreate these images that inspired me at age 10, that were iconic to me, uh, and then unfolded on the television screen. So I'm beginning with, uh, two images. Um, one is Michael Jordan soaring through the air uh, during the slam dunk contest of that year. But I'm creating these images so large now, Michael Jordan's image will be 20 feet. And now these things are no longer intended to hang on a wall anymore. I'm creating them as giant movie screens, monoliths, you know, the land in a space. And so you will be forced to walk 20 feet across and then see the back side of the painting and there will be that's a double-sided image mm -hmm. and on the back side is a colonel uh is an image of colonel lieutenant lieutenant colonel oliver north swearing under oath i watched both of these images unfold on that same screen as a kid you know uh, a few weeks apart from each other and so the idea the grand idea is to create an unfolding series and start to design spaces like mazes so that you as a viewer get trapped and tangled within American history. I will premiere these paintings um, in the fall of 2024. I am in the very first stages of working uh, on my, um, to prepare for my first survey show, 25 years of work that will launch at the Contemporary Arts Museum here in Houston, and then we'll travel to Mass Mocha uh, in spring of 25 and hopefully a few other venues across the country. It's kind of a terrifying thing, 25 years, it's, it's way too fast. I don't know that, I'm, that I feel ready yet, um, but it, I'm working with two very amazing curators, uh, Denise Marconish being uh, one of them at Mass Mocha and Patricia Restrepo here at CAM, but they are so ambitious about taking everything that I've done and trying to smash it all together to see what the story being told is. Um, it's a scary thought. My, my biggest fear is walking into a space, seeing these things communicate for the first time, and then saying to myself, this is it. This is all I've done in 25 years. Uh, 
but I, I think that, uh, you know, we're going to actually have too much work because the work is so large scale. It's going to be very difficult to uh, uh, try to minimize uh, the body work. That sounds amazing. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Um, yeah, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from anybody in the... Uh, Anne says, very inspiring. Uh, Kay says, um, whoops, sorry, I lost my place. Oh, Kay says, so excited to see that. Uh, Elizabeth Fusco, this was an amazing talk. Thank you. Aneta says, thank you for sharing your process. This was great. And Luanda is commenting with wonderful talk. Robin says, this was great. I'm echoing that as well. This was really a great talk. It was really great to see all this work. Vincent, I really appreciate your sharing all this. Um, no worries. I, I appreciate the invitation once again. And uh, if anybody um, has any interest, I, um, my first monograph is coming out. It will be released this spring through Radius Press. And they are such an amazing team in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Beautiful art books. Um, It'll focus on series like the city and the presidential suite of lithographs. Great. And what you mentioned your Instagram is where you sell prints. What's your Instagram handle? It is uh, Vincent Valdez 77. Vincent Valdez 77. Well, that's great. Thank you. And thank you again, Vincent, uh, for this great talk. Thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, please visit our website at manhattangraphiccenter.org to sign up for future talks and see our other events and classes and to sign up for our mailing list. Also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to keep up to date. And everyone have a great night. Thank you again, Vincent. And thank, thank you. you. Bye thank you. And we'll stop the recording. Right? Go okay. ahead.